Today in history, missile mail, yes, a real thing, yes, done by the United States Post Office. It is pretty cool that today, for the price of a decent cup of coffee, you can get the United States Postal Service to pick up and deliver a letter to anywhere in the continental United States in just a day or two. But, you know, it hasn't always been that way, and there's a reason we call it snail mail. To get around the problem, for a brief time in the 1950s, the USPS dared to dream big like rocket ship big. Yep, on June the 8th, 1959, the then named US Post Office Department in conjunction with the US Navy launched a rocket laden with what they officially dubbed Missile Mail. Now, they were not the first to try sending projectile transmitted messages. Indeed, arrows have been frequently used throughout history to send messages over rivers and castle walls and things like that. In slightly more modern times, author Heinrich von Kleist suggested in an 1810 article, aptly named Useful Inventions, that shooting artillery shells loaded with letters would be a great way to rapidly send important mail throughout Germany via establishing a relay network of this type of artillery. Now, that idea back in Germany, it never really got off the ground, but others later who had the same idea actually had some degree of success. For example, in the late 19th century in Tonga, residents of an island called Nyafo, and I don't know how to pronounce it, I did look it up, I even found out that it literally means many new coconuts, but its pronunciation remains a mystery. Anyway, these people decided that they would try using Congreve rockets to send and receive mail. You see, this island lacks beaches, it also lacks a harbour, and it's also got the second deepest oceanic trench in the world right next to it, which means it's uh, pretty much impossible for a ship to drop an anchor. This meant that getting mail from a ship to the land was something that wasn't regularly done, despite the fact that ships were frequently passing by the island. The ultimate solution to leverage the existing ship traffic here for sending and receiving mail was simply to have ships drop cans containing mail into the water and then blast their horns as they passed by. Then people from the island who were really good at swimming would actually swim out and collect the cans before the current took them away. At the same time, these swimmers would carry messages from the island to the shipping lane and drop them off with cans letters picked up when the ships went by. This all led to the new Coconut Island getting a name I can pronounce, and that's Tin Can Island. So the primary problem with these rockets was that they were really inaccurate and not exactly reliable. This is notably illustrated by British officer cadet Alexander Cavill Mercer when discussing the medium-range variety during the Waterloo campaign in 1815. The order to fire is given, port fire applied, the fidgety missile begins to sputter out sparks and wriggle its tail for a second or so, and then darts forth straight up the chassis. A gun stands right in its way, between the wheels of which the shell in the head of the rocket bursts, the gunners fall right and left, our rocketeers keep shooting off rockets, none of which ever followed the course of the first. Most of them on arriving about the middle of the ascent took a vertical direction, whilst some actually turned back upon ourselves. And one of these following me like a squib until its shell exploded actually put me in more danger than all of the fire of the enemy throughout the day. Alright, so now let's fast forward a few decades because in the early to mid 20th century there were lots of other attempts at rocket mail. Now arguably the most successful of these various attempts occurred in Austria and in India. In the former one, Frederick Smeadol launched a series of rockets containing mail from one town to another, including one route spanning about 6 kilometers from St. Rangund to Kumberg. This is well described in a 1934 issue of Popular Mechanics, which stated, Each rocket carries two to three hundred letters from the starting point, the Schocket, to Rangund or Kunberg in the neighborhood of Graz, whence the mail is forwarded by regular postal service. All of the mail rockets have functioned perfectly, each flight being made according to scheduled plans without the loss of a single letter. Bearing special rocket mail stamps, the letters are sealed in a metal container to prevent damage, but this precaution has been unnecessary due to the accuracy with which the rockets have arrived at their destination. Ah, unfortunately, despite the extreme success of this project, Schmiedel's efforts were cut short when the Austrian post office killed funding for rocket mail. Also, unfortunately for Schmiedel, at least in terms of his place in rocket design history, World War II began not long after. Understandably, rather afraid that his work would be used to develop rockets, not for carrying mail or for scientific usage, but rather to carry explosives, he destroyed the records of his designs and gave up on pursuing rocket technology. Indeed, later after the war, he was even offered a job designing rockets in the United States, but he said he didn't want to because he was worried that one day they could become weaponized. 
All right, so let's head over to that other country, India. Former dentist, but then secretary of the Indian Airmail Society, Stephen Smith, from 1934 to 1944, shot off about 80 rockets containing mail and other countless experimental rockets without mail. On top of letters, he also in one instance shot a rocket containing food supplies to help earthquake survivors. In addition to that, on June the 29th, 1935, he successfully shot a rocket across the Damodar River. Now, we talked about using rockets and arrows and such things to get things over rivers earlier, so what was special about this one? Well, that's because the payload was two live chickens, which he named Adam and Eve. Indeed, they survived the ordeal totally fine and spent the remainder of their days in a zoo. Like Schneidel, unfortunately, World War II saw Smith's work curtailed, and he died not long after the war ended. All right, so now let's jump across the pond to the United States, where there were several instances of rocket enthusiasts using various rocket-powered aircraft to send letters. One of these was on February the 23rd, 1936, when rockets were used to shoot a bundle of letters from Greenwood Lake, New York, to Hewitt, New Jersey, over a then-frozen lake. While the rockets ultimately crashed after a flight of only about half a mile, their payload was successfully collected by a Hewitt postal worker and then taken to the post office for further processing. All right, so let's get to the point of things, because this all brings us to today in history, June the 8th, 1959, and the U.S. Postal Service jumping on the rocket mail delivery bandwagon. But you know what the USPS did? They did it in a way more massive and a way more advanced way than anyone had done it previously. Although purported to be an altruistic endeavor designed to test the feasibility of sending mail via missile with Postmaster General Arthur E. Summerfield himself at the time waxing poetic about the potential the idea had, as far as the military was concerned, this was just a huge flex aimed squarely at those Soviets. So you see, it's at this point in history that the Cold War was just beginning to heat up and the sending of mail hundreds of miles via guided missile was seen by the Department of Defense as a great publicity stunt to use in order to show off the accuracy and the precision of the United States' nuclear arsenal. To this end, the missile chosen to carry the mail was a Regulus-1. This is a cruise missile ordinarily tipped with a nuclear warhead that, in this case, had been replaced by two mail containers. Said containers were handloaded with the help of Summerfield. After this, he then headed off to the missile's destination point. So, what was the cargo on this missile? Well, it was just 3,000 copies of a letter written by Summerfield. This was addressed to everyone from the postmasters of allied nations to President Dwight Eisenhower. In addition, it's noted that everyone aboard the submarine that the missile was launched from also got a copy of the letter as a sort of memento to mark the historic occasion. And yes, beside the inherent awesome factor of mail being sent by rocket, the awesomeness is added to by the fact that it was launched from a submarine, the USS Barbero. The target, for lack of a better term, for the missile was a naval auxiliary air station in Florida, which was about 200 miles away. Launched a little afternoon on June 8, 1959, the missile landed safely after a mere 22-minute flight. As mentioned, Summerfield was waiting to hand-collect the mail, and from there the letters were taken to a post office in Jacksonville, Florida, to be sorted like any other piece of mail. Enthusiastic about the mission and the speed at which the mail had just been transported, Postmaster Summerfield was quoted as saying, this peacetime employment of a guided missile for the important and practical purpose of carrying mail is the first known official use of missiles by any post office department of any nation. Before man reaches the moon, mail will be delivered within hours from New York to California to Britain to India or Australia by guided missiles. So at this point, it's important to point out that we don't really know if Summerfield was in on the fact that the whole thing was pretty much just a show of force for the Soviets. Indeed, he made several comments about how the post office and the defense department were going to work together to make the idea a reality. Despite Summerfield's lofty claims about the prospects of rocket mail, the idea never really caught on. That said, other attempts have since been made, such as when x Corps Aerospace used one of its easy rocket planes to carry mail for the USPS from Mojave to California City. This was a distance of about 180 miles or 290 kilometers. This did demonstrate how in the future reusable rockets may actually make it economically viable to send physical mail and packages anywhere in the world within hours. But as for now, rocket mail is pretty much just a pie-in-the-sky dream, which is kind of a shame because it makes Amazon's otherwise futuristic one-day drone deliveries seem really kind of boring. And it's at this point we'd like to say, hey Jeff Bezos, if you're watching, do remember you also own a rocket company. So come on, let's make it work.
And now let's do a bonus fact. So when we are researching old magazines and newspapers, etc., etc., for these videos, we often read the adverts because kind of seeing what people were buying in the 1930s is pretty interesting. So in that May 1934 edition of Popular Mechanics magazine that we mentioned earlier, we found a wonderful little gem about an amazing new device that was invented in Britain. The article includes pictures of a dapper gentleman sitting at his desk reading the paper while apparently talking to himself. But au contraire, he is definitely not talking to himself. The article states, Telephone conversations can now be conducted without holding a receiver to the ear or speaking directly into a transmitter by employing a recent British invention consisting of a box containing a sensitive microphone and a loudspeaker. The box is placed on the table and the person carrying on a telephone conversation may be seated in an easy chair several feet distance. And that's where we end today's Today in History. I really hope you liked Rocket Mail. If you did like it, give us a thumbs up. And if you didn't like it, give us a thumbs down or don't, your choice. And let us know how we're doing in the comments below. We're open to your feedback. We'd love to know what you think of this new series. So please do leave a comment. And as always, thanks for watching.